Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. For more than 50 years, Wild Kingdom explored wildlife and our natural world. Tonight's episode, and many others, focus on the timeless value of wildlife conservation. Wild Kingdom played a critical role in changing public attitudes about the importance of animals for the health of our planet and our own quality of life. We challenge viewers to learn about animals and get involved in conservation in their local communities. That call to action resulted in more visits to local zoos, nature preserves, and even observing animals in their natural habitats. And that connection with animals benefits all of us in the wild kingdom. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha. Hello, welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Today we'll be on top of the world, above the Arctic Circle, in the land of the midnight sun, the land where the winter is one long night and the summer is one long day, a land where even in the summer the sun never rises very high in the sky and at midnight seems to sit right on the horizon. Because of the low angle at which the sun strikes this part of the world, it's a region of perpetual cold, a land of ice and snow. <laughs> Mr. Bulk is all dressed for the Arctic and ready to go. Has he been checked out on driving a dog team? Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> What's the word, Bulk? <laughs> Hey, no, <laughs> not mama, the word is mush. That's the word. And Mr. Moak, with your permission, we'll be on our way. Alaska is a mighty big state, the biggest in the Union, and only a small part of it lies above the Arctic Circle. So as we set off, trailing the midnight sun, our journey begins near Kotzebue, the largest of the Eskimo villages. Instead of a bike, an Eskimo boy rides a sled, which he calls a comatic. Early in life, he learns to command the respect and obedience of the dogs, which are his only means of locomotion across ice and snow. The Umiak, an open boat 28 to 30 feet long, provides water transportation when a group puts out to sea, to hunt seal or walrus or whale, which supply so much of their food and other necessities. Protected from the cold by heavy sealskin parkas and pants, we soon arranged for transportation to a summer camp we wanted to visit. We thanked our friends for helping and pushed on. The Umiak is a remarkable vehicle. The walrus ivory keel acts as a runner for traveling across ice and snow. The frame is made of either whalebone or driftwood fashioned by men using only the simplest of tools. The covering is made of walrus skins, beautifully split and sewn together to form a fine waterproof covering. But even though they're highly skilled in the use of native materials, the Eskimos welcome progress, especially in the form of an outboard motor. Although the water is cold enough to kill a man in two minutes, we were amazed that this seemingly barren land supports a large animal population. Bird life is seen everywhere, even far out on the ice pack. Sea mammals are also in abundance in these cold waters. The seals, of course, are most completely at home in the water. Seals come out on the ice to sun themselves, but stay near their hole to escape when danger comes. As we rounded a ridge of ice, we suddenly came upon this fellow before he could reach the water. We 
got a close look at him and his unusual way of moving himself across the ice. He was a ribbon seal, a rather rare variety, highly prized by the Eskimos because of the handsome ribbon-like markings. We were lucky to catch a glimpse of a walrus who hauled himself up on the ice to rest during his migration north. The presence of seal and walrus accounted for the presence also of the hunters. Soon our friends put us ashore and we headed for the summer camp. On our first day in camp, a snow squall held us pretty close to our tents. But it was nothing more than a spring shower, Arctic style. Soon we were up and about. We were setting out on a seal hunt. I went along with a fellow who told me to call him Joe. Jim rode with a big man named Anto. I was interested in observing the dogs. A lead dog is carefully chosen for his superior speed, endurance, and intelligence. The leader is trained to obey the driver's commands and to control the rest of the team. Following close behind were Jim and Anto. Experience or instinct, or both, lead the Eskimo almost unerringly to his quarry. Like all peoples who live close to Mother Earth, he kills not for sport or pleasure, but simply to survive. And his worth as a man is measured by his skill as a hunter. Joe has found two seals on the ice. Antuk remains near the sleds, while Joe and I move up on the seals. Now Antuk, who prides himself on his marksmanship, has spotted another seal and will test his skill. The seals are taken back to camp to provide food and clothing, even tents and boats. Watching these skilled huntsmen at work, I could appreciate why these people we call Eskimos call themselves Inuits, meaning the men. On the way in, we were joined by some other hunters. And then by a large flock of low-flying king eider ducks. Now, one way to catch a bird on the wing is to use a bola, a long cord with heavy weights at the end. All you have to do is to sling it into the flock. With his wings tangled in the bola, the bird can't fly away, and it's no great trick to overtake a bird that's grounded. When you untangle his wings, you have to hang on to the bird because a bird in the hand is worth a hundred in flight. If he doesn't slip out of your hand, bola and all. To an Eskimo, a seal is both food and clothing. That's right, Marlon. This little guy might as well be named Paycheck, as far as the Eskimos are concerned. He provides for them the same thing that our paychecks provide for us. Whoops. Well, there goes our paycheck. As we continue trailing the midnight sun, our destination is Point Barrow, the northernmost point on the North American continent. From Kotzebue, we go by plane, flying over one of the most rugged landscapes in the world, the famous Brooks Range. These are the Rocky Mountains of the far north, an icy wilderness so inhospitable 
that most of it remains unexplored. North of the Brooks Range lies the true land of the midnight sun. From Point Barrow, we took off to explore the vast ice fields that border the Arctic Ocean. During the long, dark winter, the ice builds up until it reaches a thickness of over five feet. In the spring, the ice fields break up and drift apart, forming areas of open water called leads. Here, white blobs that appear to be chunks of ice often turn out to be white beluga whales. This is the home of the polar bear, the white giant of the north. This is what we were searching for, so we came down to have a closer look. We didn't have to walk far, and by staying behind the blocks of ice, we were able to observe this magnificent male at close range. The male polar bear is a solitary animal. He's also considered by some to be the largest bear in the world, reaching a length of more than 10 feet and a weight of more than 1,000 pounds. Living in isolation, polar bears generally have not developed a great fear of man. Nevertheless, this mother led her youngster away from us. He was something over a year old, and before summer ended, he would probably be on his own. A female polar bear with a cub is a very dangerous animal. So we left and investigated a nearby lead. Here was a whole school of beluga whales porpoising one after the other. They were coming up for a precious breath of air before continuing their journey under the ice. As whales go, these are small ones, seldom reaching more than 12 feet in length. However, they're the only all-white whales. The presence of the watery leads showed that the ice field was breaking up. pilot recommended that we take off before our landing strip cracked up. So we headed back to our base camp at Point Barrow. Spring in the land of the midnight sun was on its way, and we now move south to see some of the land animals of this world of ice and snow. Winter is long and hard, and on land only a few animals can find food in these harsh months. The great Alaskan moose, the largest deer in the world, has already lost his enormous antlers by early spring. The willow ptarmigan is the state bird of Alaska. He doesn't fly south for the winter, but camouflages himself in white plumage. For food, he scratches down to find frozen seeds and berries. When the snow leaves the land, many birds that have flown south return to the Arctic to raise their young. The snow goose, conspicuous against the brown tundra, lays its eggs in a shallow nest. The young hatch just in time to reach flying age before the land once again freezes over. Silhouetted against the sky, the white doll sheep is one of Alaska's most striking animals. The lambs are born in the spring and are able to keep up with their parents no matter how rough the terrain. Although he blends with the winter snow, the doll sheep can be seen for miles against the dark colors of summer. On the same slopes, the red fox raises its young. Now the den is a playground for the active cubs, whereas a few months before, it was a haven for the parents against winter's violence. With the coming of spring, the bull moose again grows a set of fantastic antlers, which may be five to six feet across and weigh up to 60 pounds. Not all the animals of Alaska are native to the land. The reindeer, who lives in the open tundra, was imported from Siberia in the 1890s and is used today by the Eskimos in many parts of the Arctic, just as the Laplanders have used them for centuries. It's roundup time. We've now moved on to Richards Island in the Northwest Canadian Arctic. Here every summer the reindeer are rounded up for a count of males, females, and fawns in this enormous herd which numbers five to six thousand. 
The corral is a sea of antlers as they all mill in one direction. From the large corral, they're cut out in small groups and funneled into the tagging pens, where the fawns and any adults who may have been missed before get numbered ear tags. Here young Eskimos stage the Arctic equivalent of a rodeo. Eskimo girls keep a running count of the herd. During the tagging, some of the strongest deer are singled out for harness use to pull sleighs. The chief herder, Michael Pope, is a Laplander and is in charge of the roundup. Tagged animals are turned out in the release corral and held there until some 1,500 to 2,000 animals are gathered. Then they're released to go thundering out across their tundra home. Jim, I don't think there's any question about the fact that in the future, the domesticated reindeer will be a dependable source of food and clothing for the Eskimo. Yes, and for us, fortunately, there's a much better way to ensure that we have food and clothing when we need it. I know what you mean. Mutual of Omaha. Alaska remains one of the continent's last strongholds of big game animals, such as the polar bear, the caribou, the grizzly, and the moose. Of these, the moose, more than the others, seems to be holding its own. After flying south to the southern coast of Alaska, my trip ended, but Jim stayed on to take part in an exciting project with the Alaska Game and Fish Commission, the capturing and tagging of young moose to study their habits and movements. The calving grounds where this tagging had to be done are boggy tidal marshes, completely inaccessible by land transportation. To solve this problem, the Alaska Game and Fish Commission enlisted the help of helicopters and combat pilots of the U.S. Army. Project leader Bradley briefed us on a map of the calving grounds known as the Sitna Flats. This moose tagging program is one of the many studies being carried on by the Alaska Game and Fish Commission to conserve the wildlife resources of our largest state and last frontier. Our pilot was Army Captain Wesley Wilson of the famed Polar Bear Squadron. As we crossed the lake, we caught sight of a cow moose who had apparently been feeding in the shallows. I was surprised at how fast she could swim. There's no doubt that moose are very much at home in the water. Captain Wilson discovered the reason for her concern. Her calf was not far behind. Even at his age, he was a good swimmer. He was just the right size to tag, so we dropped down to see if we could chase him ashore with our rotor blast. After hovering over him for quite a while, we knew our plan was futile. So we headed out over the flats in search of more cooperative moose. This marshland is ideal moose country. Plenty of tender plants to browse on, yet enough cover to hide the young calf. I was on the intercom with a pilot, but we were all on the lookout. Suddenly, off to my right, I spotted a moose with twins, and they were making good time. One of the calves was lagging behind. At first, I thought he wasn't able to maintain the pace, but then I realized what was happening. He had dropped behind and was instinctively looking for a place to hide. Almost as fast as he dropped, 
he disappeared into the willows. And now our task was to separate the mother moose from its other calf. At first, no matter how close we hovered, she wouldn't leave the calf. Finally, the second calf dropped down to hide, and now we had our chance. After herding her off quite a ways, we went back after the calf, thinking that we had an easy job. But he had other ideas. Jack Didrickson was to make the jump. I was right behind. We knew that anything could happen. I didn't like the thought of sinking into that cold, wet marsh beneath it. But that's the way it had to be. It must have been pretty frightening for the calf, so we did our best to reassure him. Lee Miller took up a post to protect us, just in case the helicopter wasn't able to keep the mother at bay. The metal tag identifies the calf, sort of like giving him a social security number. The big strip of red plastic makes it easy to spot the tag calf from the air. While Jack and I were working, Lee kept his eye on the copter and the mother moose. A cow moose with calf can be as dangerous as a mother polar bear out on the ice pack. Both ears are tagged in case one tag comes off. Growth records are a vital part of the study. So leaving the helicopter to hold off the moose, Lee Miller joined us in tying up the calf in order to weigh him. Hooking the scale onto the rope, we found our long-legged moose weighed a hefty 80 pounds. In time, he'd grow to weigh 1,500 pounds or more. Mother may still decide to come to the rescue. Lee went to stand guard again, so Captain Wilson could come down and pick us up. Our moose was in good shape. We didn't want to release the calf yet for fear mother might come charging up to him. We held on until Lee could join us. When we did let go, the calf's new ear tags glistened in the sun. sure they would find each other. And he wasted no time in beating it back to his mother. For this young fellow, the day's work was over, but not for us. We had at least 200 more moose calves to tag. Jim, tagging moose from a helicopter is an exciting way of doing it, but it does seem a little dangerous. Well, it is, but when I realized that they did this 20 times a day, I soon had great confidence in their ability. The land of the midnight sun is a vast wilderness area of rugged peaks, frozen tundra, and endless miles of ice. To survive here, the animals and the people must adapt to these extreme conditions. 
The Eskimo has been established here for more than 2,000 years, and change comes slowly. Although in many areas he now uses white man's rifles, his knives and tent canvas, here above the Arctic Circle, a way of life has been frozen almost as hard as the earth, and the land of the midnight sun remains a lasting part of the wild kingdom. The company with health insurance for people of all ages has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Like what you saw? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com. Mutual of Omaha. Protect your kingdom.